Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, wow, I can't believe all you young kids and uh, all look like the acting type of people. So, the kind of clients that I have, actually. So, except uh, some, some of them are a little older, some of them are about your age, but uh, I am, I'm not used to public speaking. I don't know if you can hear me. You hear me okay? Yeah. All right, good, okay. So what I'm going to do is, I have a lot of notes that I wrote, and uh, I think I'm going to go through them. Uh, I don't exactly know where to begin, but let me just tell you, I am an accountant, and uh, what happens is, when I say that, usually in conversation, it's it pro usually puts a stop to all conversation, because accounting is probably the most boring thing that one can do. So when I meet people and I say I'm an accountant, they all say, oh, and there's nowhere else to go after that. But that's what I am, and, uh, and, uh, but it becomes interesting, and I'll, I'll explain to you what I mean. I, when I was in high school, I took a bookkeeping course, and I found bookkeeping to be logical. It was just interesting to me what happens is you know, I don't know if you were familiar with it, but like debits and credits, and like the debits have to equal the credits, and as long as they equal, everything is fine, and, and to me that was logical. I'm not very good in math, to tell you the truth, but logic like that and bookkeeping, I understood it. So what I did is I graduated from high school, I went off to college, and since bookkeeping was easy for me, I decided to major in accounting. I got this accounting job in a very large firm, and I hated it. It was like the worst thing in the world. I couldn't believe that I was doing this. I was working for, I was doing accounting for like, you know, large businesses, uh, uh, the garment industry, and I would go in there once a month and look at their books, and I couldn't believe I was doing it. It was like boring, I hated it. I decided to leave that firm and go to a very small firm, and that way I would be working a little more closely with people, and what happened was I found that to be a lot more tolerable. And, however, what happened with this firm is they moved out to Long Island. I lived in a city, and I was, here I was reverse commuting, and that again was like the worst thing in the world. I was working out in Jericho, Long Island, they were sending me out to do uh, books for doctors and dentists and lawyers and everything, and I couldn't believe I was doing this either. At that time, I was, uh, I was married. We had a, a small child. And again, this was my second accounting job. And so what happened was is that at this point, my life really was mediocre at best work-wise. I was earning, I took a look at it today, at that time I was earning, it was 1981, I was earning $28,000 a year. And I, look at, I looked at the inflation schedule today and that's the equivalent of about $70,000 in today's dollars. So I was making ends meet, things were, you know, were, not living hand to mouth, but it was, I was able to pay the bills. But I looked at it as though, where was my life going? I had no idea where it was gonna, you know, this was it, this was my life. And I wasn't happy with it. And at that point I decided, I didn't know what to do, I spoke to my wife. I thought maybe I would, you know, I liked music, whatever it was, rock and roll, I was gonna open up a record store. I thought maybe I'd just take a, you know, a hiatus from accounting and, uh, and uh, maybe drive a cab for a while until I figured out what I wanted to do. And one, whatever it was, one night shortly thereafter, I, I said to myself, you know, I said, schmuck, just look at least for another accounting job. Who knows, maybe there's something out there, you know something in the city. And what happened was, is that I, uh, 
I picked up the New York Times the following Sunday, and, uh, and sure enough, there was a small little ad in the, I don't know if they have this now in the New York in Times, whatever classifieds, but uh, it was an accounting job, it said, and it said it's a, an accounting firm that specializes in the entertainment industry. And I said, oh, entertainment industry? That sounds interesting. I said, I love music, I love movies. And I decided to apply for that job. I applied for that job and they offered it to me. Uh, what happened was I went in to the firm and this guy met me in this beautiful three-piece suit. As I said, I was working out on Long Island, reverse commuting. This guy, this office was at 1700 Broadway in 54th Street. Beautiful offices with windows like you're overlooking all of you know the Hudson River, New Jersey. I was seeing airplanes, you know, coming in and out of Newark Airport. And I said to my, and he had this beautiful office with a mahogany desk and a couch. And I said, you know, I can live in a place like this. And they offered me the job, and they offered it to me with the same exact money that I was earning, twenty-eight thousand dollars a year. And what I did was I, you know, I said to him, I'll get back to him, whatever it was exactly, I don't remember what, but I called my friend who's a headhunter, and I said to him, I said, Mark, this is what they offered me, what do I do? He said, don't take it, because you should always get an increase in salary. Don't, you know, and I thought about it for no more than a half a second. I said, screw this, I'm taking this job. And what I did is I, accepted the job, I, and uh, what I hated about accounting, all of a sudden I just fell in love with it. And uh, just one second. What they did was they, first day in the job, they put me into, a, uh, into an office, and in the office was cartons, and it was, car it was files of a rock and roll client that they had. And this client was, I don't know if, I, I can give out names, it's not, it's not a secret really, but she was a punk rocker, this was 1981, it was a, a woman named Nina Hagen. I don't know if anybody heard of her or not, but I opened up and I was looking at these files and I was fascinated with it. I mean, it was the most, I, I was like in heaven. Seventh heaven, I mean, it was like, here I am looking at paperwork, a contract between her and Columbia Records, and I, uh, uh, I, I looked at every single piece of paper. I was so, uh, I, I loved it. I, and what happened was I loved working with these people. I, I, I don't know. I. I I guess in a way, I hate to say it, but working with these people made me feel a little bit more important. And I think that was necessary for myself. I needed that, that boost. I was handling mostly all rock and roll clients. I started dealing with members of uh, the E Street Band. Three band members became my clients. At, I was working at this, again, this was 1981. I was working at this accounting firm, and as I said, they were handling mostly all music. Uh, and so three members of the E Street Band, one of them was uh, Clarence Clemens, another one was Steve Van Zandt, and another one was uh, uh, Danny Federici. And I became very close with these people. I also worked on tour accounting for rock and roll. And what I loved about it was a lot of fun. I would get all area access passes and I'd go to the concerts and I'd go, you know, with my wife, with my son, with friends and this, it was the start of a, a great life actually in this, in this business. I was also handling, you know, getting to the acting part of it. I know you guys are all actors. I was handling one actor client at this firm and his name was Daniel U. Kelly, which I'm sure most of you never heard of. He was on a TV series at that time. And I bring up his name because this was a, a pivotal 
moment, basically, in my career taking off. The firm, at that point, there was another accounting firm where the accountant died, and a lot of actor clients started coming to this firm that I was working at. And they handed me these actor clients. And I was reluctant to do so, but I had no choice. I liked working with the rock and rollers. I didn't like working, I didn't want to work with the actors. One of the reasons was I felt as though, and I, and I don't mean to say this in any kind of, because you'll see that I don't mean it later on when I, as I'm speaking. I felt that the actors really didn't have a profession and I felt that the rock and the musicians did have a profession. They were playing guitar, they were drums, whatever it was. And the actors, I felt, were just pretty faces. That was my own naivety at, at, at the time. And also, I felt that the egos of the actors were just bigger than the, uh, than, than the musicians. But as I said, I had no choice and I was working for this firm and I was starting to deal with these actors. Uh, as I said, I had no choice, but this is what I did and, uh, and it was fine. I was, I was growing at, at this firm. I want to just tell you a little bit of something of what we do as accountants for actors. First of all, in Hollywood terms, they don't call me an, act, uh, an accountant, they call me a business manager. So I'm no longer an accountant, I'm a business manager. So when, what it means is that when someone becomes a client of ours who's an actor, who's, who's first starting out, what we do for them is we do their, it's a very simple thing, we do their, help them do their tax returns. When they start growing or get a TV series, or start becoming big in the movie industry, we generally suggest that they incorporate. And this is a device to save taxes. At this time, what we'd start doing is re what we call real business management. What I do for these clients is our office address becomes their mailing address. And we do everything financially for them. I open up bank accounts for them. Money comes into our, our office when they get a job. I deposit it. All their bills, electric, telephone, cable, rent, whatever it is, all the bills come to me. It's their name, care of my address. And we pay their bills. If they have money, my job is really to help them try to hold on to their money and try to sort of like teach them that if you get a, a movie and you're making, I don't know, I'll make up a number, $100,000, you don't know when that next movie is going to come around again. And so that $100,000, you know, if I'm making $100,000 a year, I'm getting it paid over, you know, 52 equal installments. So I know how to manage my money. But when an actor is making a movie and he's doing a 10-week shoot and he's getting $100,000, it's $10,000 a week that they're getting paid. But it's really, you got to look at it you don't know when that next movie is going to come in. So my job is to try to teach them and, you know, be careful with your money because it's, it's really not, uh, it's not $100,000 a year, it's $100,000 for this job. And it's Hollywood and until you wind up getting something else, you have nothing. And so this is what I try to do. I, I, I get their money, I pay their bills, I, I don't invest their money. There's a fellow sitting back over there who, with another suit and tie, who, uh, who, <laughs> who, uh, who works for Goldman Sachs. What I do is when clients of mine have money 
and they wanted, they come to me and they say, well, what do I do with my money? And I say to them, I never give them advice on what to do with their money because it's their money, it's not my money. The way I spend my money may be different than the way they spend their money. And what they like is different than what I like. But what I do is if they do have money and they ask me what I do, what they should do, I say to them, if they say to me, for example, they want to invest, what I, I don't invest for them, I introduce them to the Goldman Sachs's of the world, to the Merrill Lynch's, to the, you know, to the brokerage firms. And what I do is I then sort of like supervise what Goldman Sachs is doing. And I report to the client and I say, you know, Goldman Sachs is losing your money. Goldman Sachs is, you know, this is what you made, this is what, you know. But I, I don't want to invest for the clients. I'd rather give it out. And uh, that way I can just be black and white with my clients and, and uh, uh, that way I'm not, also I'm not, uh, I, I think you understand what I'm saying. I, th I just feel like it's better that way. Uh, I, but we do everything for these clients, for, for my clients. If they want to buy a house, I help them with that. If th to get a mortgage, to get a car. I mean what we do for our clients is we, we try to get the best deals going and uh, as I, you know, and I don't get anything from anybody else except for my clients. My clients pay me very, very well. And, uh, and all I want to do is get the money from them, not from anybody. I don't want it to be tainted, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, but like with a car, for example, I deal with car brokers, with, uh, and, uh, with brokers who get cars for me, and we actually have them deliver to our clients. We do everything for them financially. And what happens is, in, in doing this for my clients, I become very close with my clients. I get to know their entire families. I get to know, I, I mean literally, we're not friends because they pay me money, so I can't say that we're friends, but we are extremely friendly with each other. I get invited to their weddings, bar mitzvahs, whatever it is, and vice versa. And uh, as I said, I, I, we become very close. And especially when you're dealing with the finances of a person, if you were to come to me and talk to me about your finances, it's a very personal thing, and and you have to sort of like people don't go talking about their finances except to someone like me, and then for me to be able to bounce for them to be able to bounce things off of is uh, as you see, I, I become close with them. Uh, I. I I want to tell you a couple of uh, what I think are, are interesting or great stories. And again, as I said, this is all, this is not a, I wouldn't tell secrets about what a, how much a client is making or how much a client has, but I can tell you certain things that have gone on in my life with certain clients. I have this, I, when I was working at this firm, again, I was working at this firm from 1981 to 1986. And in 1981, as I said, I had this one actor client, Daniel U. Kelly. And this other accounting firm, the guy died, we inherited some of their clients and they were actors. One of the clients that they had was Mandy Patinkin. And Mandy was like, uh, made, me, made me really nervous because you know, he'd come in and he's like, and and what happened was, is he said he didn't understand with this other accountant where all his money is and how he spent and what it is. And what happened was, is I sat down with him. Before I sat down with him, I devised a certain financial report that, um, that any layman basically could understand. And uh, I, 
I put together all of his numbers for the last couple of years of his life with this other accountant, and he sat down with me, and I remember he came in like at 11 o'clock in the morning, and, I, and we're sitting down, and I'm going over this report with him, and he was like fascinated. He loved it. He loved it so much that he called his wife, and he said, cancel that lunch that I had, because I want to, you know, whatever it is, I want to continue this thing. And, and this, to me, that was a great story, because what happened was, now all of a sudden, I realize what I have to do for my clients is I have to present to them a report that they understand that's basically a layman ease type of a report. And you guys are actors, you're not business people, and I have to be able to relate to you and you have to be able to hopefully understand what I'm presenting to you. Uh, also, in 19, at that time, in 1982, Tom Cruise became a client of ours, and he was handed over to me. This was before Risky Business, and I remember taking him out to lunch, and was sitting across from each other, and he's telling me what his goals are. And he's looking me straight in the eyes, and, and to me, it was, it was really scary, because I believed him. And I said, this kid is really uh, gonna wind up doing it, you know? He was determined, he had a, he had a goal, and he was determined with that goal, and uh, Sure enough, obviously, he did make it. He became one of the, you know, the biggest in, in the industry. Uh, shortly after Risky Business came out, he, did, he fired me. And, uh, well, it happens, you know. He fired, I think the reason why he fired me is that he became so big and I was merely an employee of this firm. I, was, I didn't have my own firm yet. I worked at this firm from 1981 to 1986, and in 1986 I quit that firm to start my own practice. So I think that's the reason, one of the reasons that he fired me was because of that. You know, I was like this little schmageggy here in New York, and he was out in Hollywood, and. Uh, so I understood it. He had a girlfriend at that time, Rebecca De Mornay, and I'm sure she was whatever, telling him, you know, who was this guy, Abe Altman. But I, so what happened was I was really depressed. He fired me, and I was like, oh my God, like I was, you know, devastated. And this was in November, I think this was in November of 1982. In April of 1983, I think it was. Yeah, in April of 1983, as I said before, I had this actor, Daniel U. Kelly, was my only, really my first actor. And what happened was he had an agent, and, and his agent called me up and he said to me, you've been handling Dan, Danny for like three years, whatever it is, and he says, for you to be able to handle him, because Danny was like a real wild Irishman, and he says, if you're able to handle Danny for, the, for this period of time, you must be doing something right, and I want to meet you. So we got together, me and this agent got together, and what he did is shortly thereafter, he referred, in April of 83, he referred Kathleen Turner to me. Now at that time, Kathleen Turner was really, really hot. She just <clears throat> was off of body heat, and Romancing the Stone was just about to come out. So as much as I was depressed when Tom Cruise left me, I was elated when, when Kathleen came to me. I hope I'm not boring everybody too much, but uh, I'm sorry if I am. Okay. Again, at this time, I go to 1986 when I started my own firm. And this one agent who, again, with Kathleen and, and, uh, and, and, and Danny, 
he started referring, uh, what happened was I left my firm in 19, I left the firm I was working for in 86, started my own firm, and we had a very small firm. It was me and this one fellow, Frank Salvaggi. We quit that firm at the same time. We started our own practice. It was in my living room. We had two or three employees, and every client that I had at that firm left that firm and came with me. They, uh, they did uh, try to sue me, but it, it didn't work out. <laughs> anyway, we, we had, many I had many clients at that time from Saturday Night Live. Sarah Jessica Parker was 17 years old at the time, 18, whatever it was. She was a client of mine since 82. 80 about that, so she was about 18, 19 at that point. She came with us, and so we started off in my living room with these three employees, and now we are a firm with an office in New York and an office in Los Angeles, and we have about 80 employees at this point. Uh, this one agent, as I, as I mentioned, he started referring every client to us. He, uh, he were, one, some of them were like John Goodman, Annette Benning, John Turturro, et cetera, and I can just go on. And what happened was is, he's not gonna like me saying this, but my partner, when John Goodman came in to become a client, we were really growing and you know, it's like, we didn't know, you know, do we hire more people? What do we, and he suggested, let's not take Goodman on because he's a big fat guy, he's never gonna amount to anything. And uh, I said, you know something, he's a nice guy. You never know with anything. And what happened is, is that John became John and uh, you know, he got Roseanne show and whatever, he just became huge. Uh, I wanna tell you a, a John Turturro story for a moment. 20 years ago, John was an actor, but he wrote a movie and he tried to get finances for it. And he struggled, he really had a hard time getting money together for it. And it was a movie that was loose, based loose, or loosely based on his father's life, is that the way, whatever it is. And when he finally got the money together for it, I was so excited for him that I volunteered to, I called him up, I said, John, I will do anything. I want to help you out with this movie. What I'll do is I'll leave the office at three o'clock every day, I'll come to the set, I'll get coffee for you, for the, whoever it is, and, and uh, whatever, I just wanted to help him out. The next thing I know is I get a phone call from a, ca from a casting director, and he wants me to come in to audition for a part in his movie. And, but, and I'm saying this because I, I think it's important for you guys to hear what, what I'm about to say. What John did is John I, cast me as a hardware store owner. I had a small part as a hardware store owner in this movie. And he says to me, the reason why he wanted me in this role is because I was the owner of a business. And he wanted to get that feel of, you know, the hardware store owner of a business and me, the owner of my business. And he felt, so that's what I wanna, what I wanna convey basically to you, that he, he felt that I was the only one who would really be able to, to grasp that role. And, uh, so I said, oh wow, anyway, so what I, I of course, you know, I, I did the part, and uh, this was 20 years ago, all right? And the movie wound up being at the Cannes Film Festival, and it actually won the Camera de Oro Award, which is for first time directors, and I was, I walked the red carpet in Cannes. I mean, what, what, what better can you have, you know? And the movie was called Mac, by the way, so if anybody hasn't seen it or wants to see it, you can see me in a small part in that. Uh, 
I, I, I want to mention something else now, and also relevant to what I, what I just said. On a personal note, I want to let you guys know that I happen to be Jewish, and I'm also, also Orthodox Jewish. And what that means is I, I tell my clients they can get in touch with me 24-6, I guess, you know? Like, they can't get in touch with me from Friday night until sundown Saturday night. But otherwise, you know, so, but, and I'm saying this for a reason, for a couple of reasons, basically. 15 years ago, uh, Ashton Kutcher met with me, because he just got a TV series called The 70s Show, and uh, so he came in to interview me to be, you know, as an accountant. So here I am sitting with him, and here is this young kid, he was 19 years old, out of Iowa, and, and, and as I said before, with actors, with egos, whatever it is, I, it sounded like he really wanted me to be able to come to see his, uh, they, they, what they do is they shoot a sitcom in front of a live studio audience on Friday nights. And I tried to explain to him that I wouldn't be able to do that because I'm Jewish and I'm Orthodox and, and the Sabbath starts on Friday night. And here I am trying to explain this to a kid from Iowa who's 19 years old and saying, you know, what does Friday night have to do with Saturday, whatever it is. But uh, needless to say, anyway, he, he hired me anyway. And he said, okay, fine, you'll never come see my show, I understand but he hired me anyway. And, uh, and I bring this along also because of John Turturro again. I told you 20 years ago, John made this movie called Mac. Fast forward 20 years later, I got my second role in a John Turturro, my second role in a movie, and it's again another John Turturro movie. John just made a movie and of which he needed rabbis. And so he asked me if I could grow a beard. And I grew a beard and he gave me a, a part. I have a small part in a new movie that has not yet come out. It's called Fading Gigolo. And it stars Woody Allen and uh, Sharon Stone and me, you know, whatever it is. But anyway. <laughs> but. I can't wait, I haven't seen it yet, but it did play in the Toronto Film Festival recently. And, but this is where what happens is, so I'm in this scene, and with me and two other rabbi types, you know, and we're interrogating Woody Allen. And Woody Allen is standing there with his lawyer, Bob Balaban. And all of a sudden, in part of the scene, in walks this actress, and I'm sure you guys heard of her, Vanessa Paradis. She, I don't know if you know who she is. She used to be Johnny Depp's ex-girlfriend. She's a French actress. But she's in this scene, and what happens is, as I said earlier, you know, with pretty faces and, you know, with whatever it is, but she, she acted in this scene like everyone in the room was like, a gasp as to what we just saw, this like magical acting performance. And I realized that acting is also a profession, and it is also, and it's very hard, because I know I, I, I couldn't do what, what these people, what the actors do. I remember seeing Kathleen Turner many, many years ago in a play at, at Long Wharf, and again, I was like blown away. I, Acting is not just a pretty face, it's like, it's hard work. Uh, but I wanna leave you with, with one other thing. Uh, I wanna say that I am, I love what I do. I love the entertainment industry. I love working with actors. I love being able to help them out. And uh, I love the fact that I found my niche in life and uh, I'm blessed, I'm very fortunate. 
And I also want to say that to you guys who are starting out and, and stuff like that, just be careful. You know, it is a business, and I'm involved in the business end of things. There's money involved in it, and just be careful to whatever, you know, hold on to your money because who knows, it's a, it's a weird, Hollywood is a weird place. And um, I think that's it. I want to wish all of you luck and my pleasure to be here. So, thank you. All right, hey, do, do we have uh, time for a few questions? Uh, any questions from the audience? Hi, thank you. You're welcome. So, as future entertainers in the room, what should we look for in a accountant slash business manager, and why should we choose your organization? My organization? Yes. Uh, I, I don't know why. I mean, there are a lot of accountants out there, there are a lot of accounting firms out there. Let me just tell you, we're in New York, we are probably the pro most preeminent of the accounting firms who specialize with actors. In, we have an office in Los Angeles, and my son works out of the LA office. In LA, we are literally a dime a dozen. There are millions of us out, accountants out there in LA. Over here, there are very few of us. But I, we understand the life of an actor. We understand the finances of an actor. And uh, I think what you got to look for is somebody who you can have a personal relationship with, somebody who you can look into their eyes and, look at, and vice versa, that you feel comfortable with, somebody who you feel like you can trust, who's, who's going to be there for you, who's going to be there to help you out, uh, who's not going to let you down, who's going to be professional. And I think that's what you should look for. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Josh. I'm a second year student. Um, I'm wondering, how do you guys choose uh, which clients to take on? <laughs> as long as you're an actor, I take you on. Okay, and I don't, I mean this sincerely, it's not about making money. I love making money. I'll tell you, a, a, client, a client comes into me and is making literally nothing, all right? And that's fine. But I also, let me tell I want to tell you how we charge. Generally, the general way that business managers charge is 5% of an actor's earnings. So if you make zero, 5% of zero is how much, Josh? Zero. 5% of zero is zero. But I also tell this potential client like you, I'm hoping that you are eventually going to make $20 million. Because if you make $20 million, I make a million. And I love making a million dollars. <laughs> okay? But I'm also willing to not make it. You know why? Because one actor begets another actor. And I always felt like, you know, if you're doing a good job, from, like myself, if I, try, if I do a good job, you're going to recommend somebody else and somebody, and, and that's how we've grown, so. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Hi, um, I don't know if this is like a personal question, but I was just wondering how much do you charge each client? How much do we charge each client? Yeah. As I said, we charge Five percent of their earnings. Okay. That's the norm in the industry. Good evening. I wanted to know: um, Do you only um, specialize in the, uh, the 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 money part of managing the client, or do you um, manage them all around in uh, different aspects of their career, or is it just money? Career-wise. An actor has to have an agent. Some actors have managers also. 
what I do is I work with the agents and I'll give you a, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of a story that happened once with a client. I was having a financial meeting with a client and in this financial meeting I'm sitting there and showing this client how in six months they were going to be out of money. Okay? They were not going to have any more money left, seriously, because of the amount of money that this client was spending on a monthly basis and there was no money coming, coming in. From my office, this client called his agent and said, I'll do that job for the money. At that time, this was like 20 years ago also, at that time, this was a, fa a famous actor and at that, uh, he, when he said, he called his agent from my office, I'll do that job, he, I paid three million dollars for that job. Okay, that was, it was a good payday. What happened was that movie was supposed to be the beginning of a, maybe a three series type of a thing. It was the biggest bomb going, okay? So what happens is, what I'm saying is, I'm involved in it from a financial point of view, but then the client has to, makes that, makes that decision with their agent, with their manager. I felt bad that this movie bombed, but it wasn't my fault that I just told the client the black and white of their life. And then it's, it's their decisions what to make. They could have stopped spending money somehow or other maybe as opposed to taking that movie, but it's their choice, it's their life. Hi, um, I was just wondering, um, you said that, What's your name? oh, uh, my name is David. David. And, um, you said that you need obviously need an agent, but how 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 what's what I'm looking for? Do, do you really need ma um, a manager? Like, why would I really need a manager? Other than the money aspect, obviously. David, it's a great question. The way I see it, the, my experience is that agents may have a hundred clients, but a manager only has maybe ten or fifteen clients, so they can devote more time to helping your career. What it does, it costs you an extra 10 or 15%. An agent charges 10%. A manager charges 10 or 15%. So you have that added extra, on co extra cost added on to what you're gonna have to pay when you get a job. Do you need a manager? No, you, there's no, you don't. But th can it be helpful? It can be. Can it be not helpful? Yeah, also. I hope that sort of answers your question. Oh, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was the interpreter or what? <laughs> Hi, I'm Lewis, when you, first year at conservatory. Um, my question is, well, uh, does your firm have tax attorneys also? Is it just CPA? And how does it handle international accounting? Uh, we don't have tax attorneys on staff. We have only CPAs. Uh, if we need outside counsel or international taxation and stuff like that, we have a lot of clients, obviously, who are working out of the country, uh, you know, making movies in England and Italy, whatever it is. What we do is we hire counsel in those countries to make, to work on deals with the studios so that clients are not taxed extra by working in a foreign country, and uh, so we hire outside counsel for that. Does that also include uh, international banking, like using banks overseas to I, I, I don't know what, what you're getting at. What do you, what do you, what do you? Like if you live overseas, yeah. you know, do you handle overseas accounts? We have clients who are, who live overseas, I have a client who's Irish, a, a fairly famous actor, who's, and as a matter of fact, it's funny because he comes in, we have a meeting, I said, do me a favor, put on your American accent, because you know, like he, cause he, when he acts, he also acts as an American sometimes, and I don't understand him with his accent, you know? So he talks to me in, in American English, you know? But uh, we have clients, and we, yeah, we work with, if, I don't know if that's what, yeah, yeah, okay. You're welcome.
Hello, I'm Noreen, and um, I'm one year acting. And I would like to know if you, if you're now an actor in the industry and you go about choosing a accountant, what would be a red flag? Like, do not trust this person with your money. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you've seen the person written up in the newspapers as a thief, don't hire him, you know? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, as I said, you ha I think the best way is just to get a referral from a friend, from another professional. I would not just look in the yellow pages. I would just try uh, get a referral. How you doing? I'm Anthony. How come you don't feel comfortable handling the investment portfolio side? Be, because uh, that's a good question. Some accountants do that. I don't. Uh, I feel it's not a specialty of mine. I feel like I don't have enough knowledge to, uh, to tell somebody to invest in IBM stock versus Google versus anything else. I just don't have that expertise. Uh, and, and also, by doing that, I would be advising. And I don't, I don't know if I got it through or not, but I don't like to advise clients. Like this client who was spending a lot of money, I just gave the black and white picture of their life. And I want them to make their decisions. I don't want to make a decision. I don't want to advise them to take a movie or not to take a movie based upon their finances. It has to be their decision. The same thing with investments. I wouldn't. I just don't feel comfortable with it. I wouldn't feel comfortable in telling them to buy an apartment here versus an apartment there or anything like that. Uh, it's just not my, my style. And I found it to work really well for me. That way I can go to the professionals, stick with those people who know what they're doing, and in introduce my clients to them and let, let the professionals do what they're supposed to be doing. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't want to do any more. I think we have time for one more question, if there's, if there's another question out there. You need a mic, but I think my mic is dead, so project. <laughs> project. Um, hello. Hi. My name is Claro. Um, I understand that you are in another level, but with your experience, what do you, what do you have to say to you know, actors that Well, I, I think what you have to do is whatever it is that one does in life, they have to persevere. In other words, you have to keep going forward. That's all you have to do. I know you have to make money. Maybe, you know, you're not making money in acting yet. I know, you know a lot of actors, you know, they do, their, their day job is waiting, you know? and. Uh, or doing other things, or being a nanny, or being a this, or a dog walker, or, or a bookkeeper, or whatever it is. But if, you, but if your goal is to act, and it's, it, you sound as though this is what you really want to do, you just got to keep plugging away. And you're going to have to go through all the bumps, and all the pitfalls, and all the pain in the asses of, of uh, and, and getting hurt. But if you want to do it, then you just gotta, somehow or other, it'll work eventually. That's my belief. And whatever it is that one does, but I think in this field for you, I think that's the way it sounds like. <laughs>